I'll do something a little different tonight. I started on this uh, last week, and uh, I never really did get to the meat of it uh, during Pastor Mike online. And what started this was uh, a sermon that I I listened to part of it. I I listened to it to where I just I couldn't listen to it anymore. And the name of the sermon was, Do, Does a born-again Christian have a dual nature or two natures? And so I, I thought, well, yeah, I want to hear this. I want to hear what he's got to say. And, you know, sometimes you can have an open mind listen to what somebody else says and you think you know he's not making a bad point and um, every now and then my mind can be changed it can be God usually does it he does it better than I do or does it better than anybody else does so I thought I'd listen a little bit I listened to about 35 minutes of it maybe and I, I just couldn't take any more because in trying to sell his point, he, he was just not really given any scriptures. And uh, maybe I should have listened to the rear end first before I listened to the front end. But I didn't much care for the front end. But this study I did... He accused anybody of believing that a Christian has a dual nature... He accused them of being in this, some group called the Sovereign Grace Movement. I think I know a little bit about what that's about. And it's about the idea that you can do and commit whatever sins you want to commit. You can go out and get drunk. You can sleep around in your wife. You can do all kinds of things. Don't worry, that's all covered under grace. You don't have to worry about it. Now, I don't believe that. I believe that if you're a child of God and you're going to attempt that, the first couple times that you do that, God's going to meet you at your doorstep with a great big old rod and he's going to beat on you until you beg him to stop. Amen? I believe God chastens his children. And that's, that's God's plan and method of just driving out this desire or this idea that we can sin all we want to and get boy that's Christian life is great because I can drink and smoke and 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 take drugs and and cheat on my wife and I'm still going to heaven that's ridiculous so he and that to me from what I'd heard is what they call the sovereign grace movement and so he takes everybody and lumps them all into one group and if you put everybody in the same sack you throw the sack into hell and say see they were in the sack they shouldn't have gone to hell and then he he accused everybody of um, listening to their pastor oh your problem is you just listen to your pastor you're too lazy to study yourself if you'd study your own bible you'd come but you would agree with me instantaneously and all this stuff or they accused pastors of just trying to uh, uh, appease a crowd Get a big church going and get the money rolling in and get a big raise and, and it's all about them. And, and I'm going, that's not what I did. One day I wanted to study salvation. I wanted to study it. I wanted to know it. I wanted to learn it. I wanted to be able to sit down with somebody this is what i believe this is why i believe it and so i didn't i didn't fall into any of those groups that this man laid out um, but i'm going to share with you some things that i have learned about my life in christ I, i've mentioned several times that growing up in this church i believed in these uh, these adults that were going to church here, that they were, you know, God's chosen people. And they never did anything wrong, and and um, they were my they were my heroes growing up. 
And um, then I find out that, you know, one of them had gone astray. My, he was cheating on his wife quite a bit. He was, another guy, he was uh, running around. He was going to bars, couldn't stay out of the bars at night. And that eventually killed him. They, they uh, found his car, uh, slammed into one of those embankments over on Highway 110. And it was in the middle of a big fog that they had that night. He couldn't see the road. He ended up, I think, swerving to miss another car. He was drunk as a skunk. And they, they cleaned up his brains off the back glass of that, of that vehicle. That's how hard he hit. And... Um, that kind of shook me a little bit because uh, I remember that, you know, he went to church here. He was one of the leaders here. Him and my dad used to go rabbit hunting all the time. And so I knew him pretty well. But I just didn't know that about him. And so that bothered me. And then there was a time in my life when I became an adult. I thought that I was nearing the time when I should attain to this perfect Christian man that no longer sinned, no longer had an inclination to sin, no longer was ever tempted to sin. I thought that I was just about, just about ready to get to that point. And God dealt with me one day. And I was just bawling my, I was right there. I was down at that altar. And it wasn't a church service either. Just one day me and the Lord had a talk. And uh, God began to reveal some things to me, but I, I wasn't satisfied with that until I had searched them out in the scriptures. And so I want us to look, start, we're going to start in Romans 7. There's a few other places we're going to go to. And I would just strongly encourage you to make your own notes on this. This will come up again. Somebody might ask you about this. You might, you might run into somebody who's said they're a Christian, but they're really having a hard time. Maybe some of the old sins that they used to have in their old life, maybe they're starting to creep back in. You know, that happens. Maybe they just don't feel saved enough. Maybe they don't feel good enough. I had a pastor's wife one time. I had ended up with preaching a revival for him and his church and he brought his wife to me now they're several years older than me and I'm going what in the world are they bringing them to me for but his wife really struggled she come from a broken home uh, her dad left at an early age and uh, her mother was a, a very devoted to Joyce Myers and um, the husband pastor brought his wife to me one time and said we you know we're having some problems and well what's going on and he said that um one sunday morning um she basically stood up pretty much took over the service and basically began to lay out accusations against everybody in the church how they weren't spiritual enough and if they were really as spiritual as, you know, they seemed to be, then they would be worshiping more, they would be singing louder, they would be standing up and waving their hands, and they would be doing all kinds of things, and so on and so on. And she actually went around, while they were singing a song, she went around trying to touch people and lay hands on them to, get, to impart some kind of spirit of worship on them so that they would be worshiping God better or something like that. And I don't, God just kind of put this in my heart, put it in my mouth. I said, can I very respectfully say something to you? I mean, they came to me, so they were looking for advice. And I said, let me tell you what I think you're doing. I think that you have grown up in a situation in life, I, I feel bad for you, but you have grown up in a situation in life where you've had no father to, to really love you and, you know, to just unconditionally care for you. You've grown up with a mom who's so devoted to jo jo Joyce Myers that 
she follows Joyce Meyer's witchcraft and basically says that if you're not rich and you're not happy all the time and you're not getting healing all the time, it's your fault. It's because you don't believe in God enough, you don't trust God enough, and you don't do this enough and do that. It's always everything you're doing wrong is the reason why God blesses you. And I would just ask you tonight, how many of you have blessings that you never asked God for? Raise your hand. I got tons of them. Things that I've never asked God for, and he's given to me. So this nonsense about you got to ask God in faith, and if, you, and if you don't get it, it's because you didn't have enough faith and all that stuff. It's a, it is bondage is what it is. And I told her, I said, let me tell you what your problem is. Your problem is, is that you want God what it, for what it meant. Uh, made all the difference in the world to me. Understand that what you're looking at up here, as far as me is concerned, is a very, very ugly representation of a very, very beautiful thing that God has put on the inside of me. Amen? And we're going to learn that from Romans 7 from some other places too. So let's read the first three verses of Romans chapter 7. And let's see here. Sermon audio is down. Got it? You understand? Okay. Romans 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now, this has everything to do with it. For the woman, which hath an husband, is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though that she be married to another man. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word. We pray, God, that you would give us light and understanding. Lord God, that you would open up our eyes and help us to see, Father, how things really are, how you see this world, how you see us. Father, how it is that Deep down inside, every one of us still has a sinful nature. But also, in every one of us, there is a different law, a different commandment, a different nature that says, I ain't never going to sin ever again. Father, help us to understand that. Help us to understand the difference between the two and what's going to happen as a result of these two natures and where they apply. So bless your word tonight. Bless these people in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, Let's go over to uh, John chapter 3, and then we're going to be in 1 John, two different places. The Gospel of John chapter 3, and then uh, John's letter, which I believe is 1 John, all right? This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Jesus is telling Nicodemus... He's told him in verse 3, Verily, verily, I say, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus doesn't understand that. So he says, how, you know, how is it that I'm an old man? I can go back into my mother's womb and come out again. I don't, I don't understand. That doesn't make sense, Jesus. Jesus wasn't referring to this body. 
going back into the womb to be born again, and then somehow it's transfigured, somehow it's changed in some way, and now it doesn't want to sin. He wasn't talking about that. And just as a just as a matter of curiosity, I just want to I want you to raise your hand if if not yet. When you got saved, did anything in your flesh change that day? Not with me. I was still that cute little kid. But I did things after I got saved that I didn't do before I got saved. Was I still saved? Okay, that's the question. And so Jesus then answers what Nicodemus is referred to. How can I be, what is this born again? How can I be born again? In verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, it's his first birth, and of the Spirit, that's his second birth, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Your mom and dad, Matthew, your mom and dad, have you ever seen me walk on water? No. You ever seen me just fly through the air, just gliding around through the air like I'm, no? Huh? Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Your mom and your dad just as raunchy and evil and wicked as the son we produced. But not the daughters. The daughters were saints, right? No, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. However, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's two entirely different births that come from two entirely different sources. Okay? Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Because Jesus, when he says born again, is not ever, ever, ever referring to the flesh body. If he were then our flesh body would be regenerated and would be eligible to spend eternity in heaven with God. But flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. Can't go. Flesh and blood has to, by way of us burying people, Either in the ground or if you're in the Navy, they bury you at sea. Just by that very act right there, we are showing that that body is never leaving this world, ever. Meanwhile, there is a body. Paul called it, there is a celestial body and bodies terrestrial. The terrestrial body is this, what you see here. It's born of this earth. It's made out of this earth. It is Adam, meaning red, like the earth, like the dirt. And to the dirt or the dust, we will return. And that's it for our flesh. But it's our spirit that's regenerated and will, is born again. Because it's born from a different source. Milton Don and Judy are responsible for this body. Mom, it's your fault. And dad's. But one thing that I saw my mama do is come down to an altar, give her life to the Lord. She was regenerated, not in her flesh, 
because I knew some of her struggles after she got saved. I knew some of them. But after a while, God began to work in her. But still, her flesh body, going to the grave one of these days. Okay? So that's what he said to Nicodemus. And then 1 John, turn there. Can you see those little verses on there? Boy, I've really improved it, haven't I? I ought to put those back on that projector screen. That way you can't see them. 1 John 3, 9 speaks of and describes what is born of God. 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now this is what throws people. They'll teach a false doctrine that says, once you are born again, you can never sin. And that's not true. It is not true. I mean, I'll just ask you, who in here really believes you are 100%, you are born again, raise your hand. Okay? And yet, which one of us has not sinned since we've been saved? All of us. But it says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. You know where? You know why? Because that which is born of God comes from the seed of God. And because God cannot sin, neither can his seed sin. It's not possible for God to lie, therefore we, we cannot lie. It's not possible for God to lust, therefore we will not lust. It's not possible for God to steal, therefore we will not steal. It's not possible for God to commit adultery, therefore we will not commit adultery. And that is all has to do with the inner man, the new man, that which is born of God. And that which is born of God, Milton Don Hoggard and I give her whole name, Julia Ann Hoggard. And $5 to anybody who calls my mom Julia next Sunday morning. I think it's a beautiful name. I do. I think it's absolutely, I don't know why. I guess back then Judy was what you, you know, Judy was a popular name. So I was thinking one day, you know, when she passes on, she's already got her headstone picked out for her and dad. And after she dies, I think me and Melissa are going to get together and write on her headstone, Julia Ann Hoggard. She's already had printed on there, Judy Ann Hoggard. I don't know how to fill that in and scratch it out. I don't know how to do it. But the inner man in me was not born of Don and Judy Hogger. It wasn't. It was birthed by God himself. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. That's how come we can love people we don't normally love. You love them with the inner man. 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. That means that us born again Christians, we not only do we love God who has begotten us, but we love everybody whom God has begotten. Amen. It's just in us. That's the new nature that we have. 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, hold on to that place right there. Turn to Revelation 13. I want to show you something now that to me now makes sense. 
Revelation 13. In verse, uh, let's see here, verse 7 of Revelation 13, talking about the beast, the Antichrist. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Oh, no. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. The beast might be able to overcome my flesh, but he cannot overcome the new man that's in me. He can't. Read that verse again. Verse uh, 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So while the beast may have power, to destroy our flesh, he does not have power to destroy the new man that's in us. He doesn't have that power. And then 1 John 5, 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. There it is, right there. Whatsoever, whosoever is born of God, number one, it sinneth not. So there it is again. This is where people get false doctrine. They forget to divide the two parts of our being. The one that was born of our earthly parents, which is wicked, versus the one that was born of God himself, begotten of God, just like Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father. Mm. I like it. So already two parts to our being. One, the outer man, which is defiled and corrupt. It was born of man. It was born of earthly woman. It is destined to die. It will fall into the ground. It will become part of the dust again. And then at the end of time, God is going to light some kind of fuse and it's all going to melt with a fervent heat, the Bible says. And it's going to be gone. Meanwhile, that on the inside, which is born of God, it doesn't decay. It cannot die because it's born of God. And it cannot sin, and it never will sin. Does everybody understand that so far? All right, now, so let's go. Oh, I like this. Turn, I want you to turn to this passage in your Bible, Psalm 34. Because I came upon this. I was actually watching... Jack Van Impey, and he said it, so I said, well, that must be true then, because Jack Van Impey... No, I'm just kidding you. I didn't hear this from Jack Van Impey. I didn't hear this from Charles Stanley. I didn't hear this from John MacArthur. I didn't hear it from Reg Kelly. I didn't hear it from anybody. I read it in the Bible. Psalm 34, verse 2. I want you to look at that verse now. Read it. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. What gender is the human soul? Female. I mean, I stop and think, think about it now. We know that Christ is the bridegroom, the husband. We also know... According to Ephesians 5, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We know that the church is rendered as the bride, the female. Men and women both. And I, I always wondered at that. I, I mean, how, what, how is it us men are marrying Jesus? I mean, isn't that a little disgusting? But Jesus is not marrying Jesus. The outside guy. 
He's marrying the soul. And the soul is his wife, a female. Okay, does that make sense now? So let's go back, let's go back very quickly to Romans 7. With that in mind. Yeah. Romans 7. Verse 1. Now think of now the man in this story. Think of it as your flesh. The woman in this story, think of that woman as your soul. And watch what happens. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over who? The man. As long as he liveth. For the woman, which is the soul, the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. So picture your soul as the woman that is married to the flesh. And she's stuck with him until he's dead. And by cracky, she's going to outlive him because she's got a $3 million life insurance policy out on him. She's going to collect every dime of it too if it takes 50 years. But the soul now is married to the flesh. When God created mankind, he created man. Even when he made the help meet for man, where did that help meet come from? The man. Okay? So it doesn't matter on the outside whether you're a man or a woman. You are mankind. Period. Flesh. So your soul is the woman the bride married to the bridegroom, your flesh. And by law, it stays that way until that old man dies. And you can't wait for that old bugger to die. Amen? Oh, I can't wait for him to die. Now watch this. Um, halfway down verse 2. But if the husband be dead... She is loosed from the law of her husband. Once her husband is dead, is she free to marry another? Yes. And that other one is, guess who? Jesus Christ. So then, now watch this. This is why when you get saved, God doesn't... Christ doesn't immediately snatch your soul out from your body and take him, take her with you, or him. Because it would be adultery. Look at what it says. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So immediately upon death, your soul is now free to marry another. And if you're smart, that other one is none other than Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, do we have evidence of this? Yes. And I don't have time to read all of this. But in 1 Samuel 25, I want you to turn there. You can also see it in the book of Ruth, too. Or, excuse me, not in the book of Ruth. Esther. You can see it in the book of Esther. Esther is the soul. 
King Ahasuerus is, um, is the husband. You know, ask, and while you're turning there, ask yourself the question. When your soul decided that it did not want to live for the devil any longer, and you went to Jesus and said, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I don't, I don't want to go to hell. Jesus forgave you, and he washed your sins away. So would it be fair then, even though your flesh has sinned, would it be fair to go ahead and cast your flesh and your soul into everlasting fire? No, it wouldn't be fair because your soul has said, I don't want to go there. Your soul is smart and said, I don't want to go there. Your flesh said, give me another beer. Or whatever, but your your soul said, "I'm not. I'm not. Listen, you can do that if you want to. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it." We used to have an old uh, lady here. I said, "Old lady." She was a few years older than me. And the preacher we had here before, uh, her husband drank a lot of beer, a lot of alcohol. He wasn't saved. And when the preacher would go over to the house, the, the wife was saved. She used to love the preacher to come by. But he'd go sit down with her husband on the porch. And that, and that man would always say to the preacher, Preacher, you want a beer? I got a fridge full of it. I'll get you a beer if you want. He just trying to mess with him. The preacher said, no, I don't want no beer. You know, eventually that guy got saved. Eventually he did. We have some people in this story very quickly. Abigail is the woman here we're focused on. And Abigail, I want you to read this whole chapter out by yourself. Abigail, very quickly, is married to a man by the name of Nabal. Not Naboth, Nabal. And Nabal is, you could sort of picture him as Brutus from Popeye. He cares nothing about anybody except himself. He's mean. He's rough. He's probably knocked Ruth, uh, excuse me, Abigail around a little bit. He doesn't care about anybody, anything except for his stuff and his own stuff. And he ain't about to help nobody else. Nobody's ever helped me. I ain't helping nobody else. Well, David has been going around with 400 men fighting and doing battles and basically saving Nabal and his farm from being invaded. David's men are tired, they're hungry, they're thirsty. So he sends a messenger to Nabal and says, will you give over for David's army? He's been fighting all these wars for you. So the servant goes and tells Nabal that. And Nabal's like, who's David? Who is he that I should give him my stuff? I ain't giving him a nothing. He can go jump as far as I'm concerned. Well, the servant goes back to David. David, he's a fiery redhead. Right? And he straps on his sword and he calls 400 of his men. He says, boys, put your swords on. We're fixing to go a killing. And David and his men get ready to go, and they're going to kill everybody in that house, including Nabal's wife, Abigail, who is a sweet, godly woman. When Abigail finds out what's going on, she saddled up some animals, she loaded them up, took some servants, she took cakes of figs, and she took wine, and she took water, and she took everything that she could get her hands on while Nabal was out on the back 40, and she rode over to where David was and bowed herself to the ground. You know who she is now? Remember, David is Christ. And Abigail is the soul of Nabal. And Abigail bows before David. 
And you know what she does? She prays forgiveness. Oh, have mercy on us. Don't listen to my Lord. Here's some cakes of figs. Here's plenty of food for you and your men. We brought some wine. We brought some water. You can even kill the camels if you want. I don't care. Just take it all. Just because if you go in killing, you're going to kill me too. And I don't want to die with that old man. And David's heart was touched by that. He unbelted his sword and laid it down. And he said, God sent you over here to change my mind. I would have been guilty of a sin by killing everybody when it wasn't everybody's fault. Boys, lay your swords down. It's going to be okay. And the story goes that, and I, there's no doubt in my mind, that right at that time, Abigail and David saw in each other's eyes, Abigail's going, boy, he treats women a lot better than Nabal does. And David's looking at her going, boy, ain't she sweet. But you see, it would have been a sin for him to just take her as his wife, wouldn't it? Would have been a sin, and God would have visited him for that. So he lets her go. She goes. Nabal, she gets there. She gets home. Nabal throws a big party for himself and gets busted up drunk. So she says, I'll wait till he's got his hangover. The next morning, Abigail goes to Nabal and says, you remember that guy, David, that was asking for help? Nabal says, yeah, what about, oh, don't talk so loud. What about it? She said, well, he was on his way to kill everybody here, including me. But I went out there and I stopped him. The Bible says that when Nabal heard that, if you want to look at it medically, he had a stroke. The Bible says his heart turned to stone. Think about it. For 10 days. What is 10 the law, the commandments. You see, that's Nabal. He is, he is what did, how did first, how did Romans 7 start out? Know ye not, brethren, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And since she's married to that man, then she is under that law as well. The Bible says that his heart turned to stone and for 10 days he laid in his bed and after 10 days, he died. And now, Abigail is free to marry another. And who does she marry? David, who is a type of Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful story, isn't it? Y'all read that. I mean, read it and study it. Get down, right down to the nitty gritty. Oh, I ain't got time to finish this one. Uh, let me read verse 4. Back in Romans 7. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. See, now Paul's saying, see, that's you. You're Abigail. You're Abigail. You've been married to this flesh. Your flesh doesn't want to get up and serve God. Your flesh doesn't want to pray, doesn't want to read his Bible, doesn't want to do this, doesn't want to do that. So fooey on your flesh. Your flesh is going to hell. And he says, uh, should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, see, your soul was being held in bondage by your flesh, wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit 
not in the oldness of the letter. That's why Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. So according to this, so far, do we have two natures that are contrary to one another. Abigail had a husband who hated David. But his wife loved David, served David, prayed to David, had her prayer answered. And God took her husband out of the way, so now she is free to marry David. That's what, to me, that's one of the sweetest stories in the whole Bible. Let's stand to our feet. I'm not even, we're near done yet. So then next Sunday night, we're going to tackle this verse that says, For if we sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Uh-oh, Bible says right there, if you sin after you're saved, you're going to lose your salvation. No, it doesn't say that, okay? Father, love you. Thank you, God, for helping me understand. And Lord, I, I, I get it. I, you, you're not going to allow me to go out and just sin and sin and sin without any consequences. You're going to chasten me. You're going to beat me, whoop me, until I can't stand it anymore. Thank you, God, for doing that in my life. I needed it. Father, do it in these people's lives tonight. Chasten them often, be time. Chasten, chasten them, God, and clean them up from the actions and the attitudes of sins. Father, do not let us develop an idea that we can sin all we want to and we still go to heaven. God, that, let that never be part of who we are. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said... Amen.